Amen. You don't have to quit worshiping the Lord now. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and praise and give him a praise. Would you yeah. stand? All over the house and just give the Lord some more worship and praise. Tell you, Brother David, I believe God just is, He takes that ride in with His children. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, yes. Amen. I tell you, uh, God, he just takes in all the worship and all the praise that his children give. Amen. And I tell you what, we can't give him enough, can we? Amen. Hallelujah. We sure can't. We can't give him enough. If you got your Bible, turn with me, if you will, to the book of uh, Ruth. The book of Ruth, chapter number one. I've never that I can remember preached out of this book before. And uh, if you will, we're going to pray here in just a moment. Uh, Sister Sandra, Brother Roger got a phone call they got to go to and an emergency phone call. So we're going to pray for uh, their family and everything that's going on. And, and so we know the devil, and he likes to hinder things. How many knows when, when God starts doing something good, the devil likes to rear his ugly head up and, and try to stop it. But the devil is a liar. Amen. Amen. He's already been defeated. And, and we're going to remind him of that this morning. You looking for that? Uh, Ruth, uh, chapter 1, it's right after the book of Judges. and Gen uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and then it goes on to Ruth. Amen. Ruth, chapter 1, and verse number 1. When you find the place, would you say amen? amen. All right, y'all already there. I'm waiting on y'all. Y'all waiting on me, ain't you? Ruth, chapter 1, and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, they were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab, and they continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, or Orpah. I don't know. It ain't Oprah, though. I know that. <laughs> Orpah, or Ophah, however you say it. And the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Now, I may not get past that this morning, but I want to keep reading just a few more verses, if you will. Verse 6, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, or daughter-in-laws, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughter-in-laws, Go return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Uh, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you tarry or wait for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the land of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave or clung unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And the last few right here. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Or where you stay, I'll stay. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, 
if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded, or her mind was made up to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. I know there's a lot of reading, but we're going to get to a point here in just a moment. If you would, though, let's pray first. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus, God, that you would just be with us this morning. And God, that you would be with Sister Sandra and Brother Roger, Lord, as they uh, are traveling and going to their family, Lord, right now. And God, whatever the, the case may be going on, Lord, you know what it is. And, and we pray that you'd have your hand upon that and upon them, Lord, keep them safe and, and keep their family safe, God. And, and Lord, we know you are still God. And Lord, you are still on the throne, still in control. And God, be with us in this house this morning as we minister your word, Lord God. Anoint us with the Holy Spirit and power, Lord God. Anoint the, the ears of the hearers to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church this morning. We'll give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 All right. Praise the Lord. While like you're sitting down, give the Lord another hand. Y'all, we seem like we're dead in here this morning. Amen. We got to get back to life. Yeah. We preached on fire last week, but I think the fire done going out, Brother Bill. We, we got to stoke it up some more. We're going to have to go downstairs and get the poker and go poking everybody. Amen. No, I'm playing. But we got to get that fire going. Be alive. God said, I'm a God of the living and not the dead. Amen. We, we are saved. We're on our way to heaven. I'll leave your names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Glory to God. We don't need to sit there. We need to be rejoicing and shouting and praising God. Amen. We are on our way to heaven this morning. I tell you what, if Ruth could praise God in the place where she was, I know we can praise God in the place where we are. Amen. Amen. But the Bible said in verse number one, Now it come to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. But I want you to look at that very first part of that verse, what it says. It says it come to pass in the days when the judges rule. But we know that uh, if you go back just the book before that, the very last verse of Judges 21, the very last verse says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so at this point in time, when Ruth, when this story is being told of Brother Rick, they don't have a king over them. They don't have a leader over them. And the Bible said it's during a dark time. It's during the period of the judges. And, and, and judges said that during that time, that it was a, a time when everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Now, can you imagine with us today what this world would be like Right now, if everybody did what was right in their own eyes, there's no leadership, there's no authority, there's no nothing, but everybody does what they want to do and what they think is right in their own eyes. I believe that's why Scripture lets us know that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death and destruction. The, the period of the judges, when the judges was ruling Israel, they had no king, they, they went and done what they wanted to do. It was a time of darkness. It was a time of sin. It was a time of immorality. It was a time of warfare. It was a time of idolatry. Listen, because people cannot just go do whatever they want to do and expect God to have his hand upon it. Amen. I know that ain't popular preaching because the, the New Age gospel, the preachers want you to think you can go out to the world and do whatever you want to do and have God's blessings on you too. But I'm here to tell you that ain't the truth of God's Word. The Bible said you must be born again. Amen. And make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And without Him, you're on your way to a devil's hell. They ain't no going out and having God's blessing on your life by living how you want to live but you got to make him Lord and Savior and King over your life. Amen. Amen. The Bible said that in the time of the judges, they done what they wanted. I'm going to tell you how they would do. God would bless them and he would bless them and bless them and bless them. And, and while they were living up God's blessings, then they would go and they would find people outside of Israel. And, and these men would shack up with outsider of women that didn't believe in the God of Israel. They believed in other gods. 
and they would be drawn away and they would find themselves out in the middle of the pig pen. They'd find themselves out in the middle worshiping other gods and, wow. and they would find themselves out in sin and in, in the muck and in the mire and they would cry out, God save us. And you know what would happen? God would raise up men and women, judges. He would raise up with some men, some women, but they would go out in the name of the Lord and would bring the children of Israel back to where they were supposed to be. Amen. And they would live high on the hog back in Israel. They would repent and ask God to come into their life. And, and, and they lived it up in Israel. And, and while God began blessing them again, you know what happened? They eventually forgot about what God had done for them. And they went right back out in the world again and found themselves in the same mess that God had just delivered them from. Uh, am I making any headway here? Do you know where I'm going with this? It, it's the the sad truth, uh, the sad state of a lot of Christians today is, is that God delivers us from something. God saves us from something. And, and we live high on the hog. We come to church and, oh, we love the Lord. We praise God. But when we go out, we get right back in the same mess that God's already oh, yeah. delivered you from. And God said, I didn't deliver you and set you free for you to turn and go back to it. But I set you free. And the Bible said, who the Son said, that's free is truly free indeed. In other words, not to turn and go back to the mess you were in, not to turn and go back to bondage and, and slavery. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a slave anymore. I don't, I was a slave to sin for far too long, but I tell you, God set me free one day, and I have made up my mind that I'm not going back to the old me. I'm not going back to the ways of death and hell, but I'm telling you, I'm on a new road now, Brother Bill. It's called called the straight and narrow. Hallelujah. You know, every once in a while I may get a little bit to the right, a little bit close to the ditch, but that's when my friend the Holy Ghost says, get over boy, you're getting too close to the edge. And I say, yes Lord, alright, here we go. I'm telling you and then you can do it. You can make it on this road that we're traveling. But the Bible said in the time that the judges were ruling that there was a famine in the land Oh, there's a famine in the land of Bethlehem in Judah. We're going to get to that right there. But just notice when there's a famine in the land. And we over here in America, we're not used to having famines in the land. Oh, come on, somebody. We're spoiled. Just like we talked about, we got good air conditioner. We got padded pews. We got a, a good church building to come into. Uh, oh, we got a bunch of friendly faces all around us and, and, and family. And listen, uh, glory to God for the things that we have. But there was a famine in the land over there. They didn't have no food to eat. Now, see, as soon as you uh, uh, wish I'd hurry up and shut up so you can go get something to eat, listen, we're going to get to that point in a moment. But right now, I'm trying to feed you spiritually. Amen. Get this spirit filled. Then we can go out and eat. But once we leave here, listen, there is no uh, there is no decrease of the food. That, that We can go anywhere is what I'm trying to say. You can go down to Jack's. You can go to Mavis. You can go to your house. You can go anywhere you want to and find food. And if you ain't got food, you can get with any brother or sister in this house and we'll give you food. I promise Amen. you. Amen. We'll take you out to eat. We ain't got to worry about not having food to eat, do we? Amen. You can tell your preacher had to buy a new shirt this morning and it's already short tail. I think she put it in the dryer or something before church. But Amen. I'm telling you, we, we, we're not worried about food. We, we have a famine. We, we don't have famine over here. But just because we don't have a famine in, in our refrigerators and in our cabinets, that don't mean that we don't have famine in other places of our lives. You see, we can have a spiritual famine in our lives. Christians, church, oh, I need you to listen to me this morning. As Christians, we can get in a spiritual famine. Oh, yes, we can. Amen. Where we lose the excitement and the joy that we used to have living for Christ. Well, our fire that we preached about last Sunday morning, our fire seems to like it, it's starting to, to blaze out a little bit. It's going down. And, and, and we find ourselves in a spiritual rut, if you will, with me this morning. We find ourselves in a place 
place where we don't witness and we don't tell our testimony as frequently as we used to anymore. Well, our, our Bible study has, has gone way down and our, our prayer lives have become stale and become weak and we find ourselves in a spiritual famine. Now, sometimes it's because of sin. And i got to tell you that sin will dry your spirit up. If you allow sin in, it will dry your spirit up. But what do you do if you got sin in your life? Well, first thing you do is you examine your heart. If you're in a, a spiritual famine, you examine your heart and confess your sin before God. Because while sin dries up your spirit, confession opens up the door to close fellowship with the Lord again. I'm telling you, when sin comes in, it, it separates you from God. It, it dries up all the anointing that God puts on your life. But when you examine and you say, Lord, I, I've got sin in my life that I need to get rid of. And you confess it to God. It opens up the door for the Lord to step in, amen, and cleanse you, and he'll pour out that anointing again on you, amen, it opens up the door to close fellowship, but sometimes, church, it ain't because we got sin in our life, you say, brother Chad, I go to church, I, I try not to sin, well, that's good, amen, I'm glad, I try not to sin too, but sometimes I fail, amen, I'm just going to be honest with you, sometimes I mess up, but when you, if you're going through a spiritual famine, and you don't have sin in your life, then that's awesome, then what do you do for that reason, you just keep on doing what you're doing, you keep praying, you keep reading your Bible, you keep going to church, you keep living for the Lord, and hold on, honey, because sometimes it's rough. You don't turn loose. You don't quit. You don't give up. You just hold on because if you don't have a sin in your life, you're going through a spiritual famine for a reason. I'm going to tell you why. Sometimes God puts us in them spiritual famines to make us hunger and thirst for Him even more. I'm telling you, if I've ever been in a spiritual famine, when I come out of it, I was more hungry for God than I ever was before. I was more thirsty for God than I ever was before. And I tasted and I seen that the Lord is good. There was a famine in the land, the Bible said, in the time of the judges. Well, listen, God's hand, when they was doing everything they wanted to do, you know what happened? God removed his hand of protection. He removed his hand of supply. We're seeing in America over the past several years and, and different leaders that's come in and out of this country, we're seeing how they decided they was going to kick God out of schools, how they were going to kick God out of our government, how they were going to kick God out of every place in our offices in this land. And we're seeing, oh, slowly but surely, God steadily removing his hand. Oh, but now we're seeing that prayers come back to Washington. Now we're seeing that prayers coming back to schools. Now we're seeing that abortion is being stopped. Oh, left and right, the God is, is moving back in. We are inviting God back in. And I promise you, glory to God, that when you do, when you let God in, you'll see the mighty hand of God work on this nation once again. This used to be the greatest nation and I still believe it is the greatest nation. I love my country. I love America. I wouldn't want to live nowhere else, but I'm telling you until we fall on our knees and repent and humble ourselves and seek the face of God, we're going to end up in the graveyard with the other great nations that used to be. But if we let Jesus in, whoa, glory, if we we'll let Jesus in, he said, then I will lift you up. People will go by. Oh, hallelujah. And they'll fall down on their knees and say that is of the greatest nation that's ever been. The hand of the Lord is on their side. Just like Israel. They said the hand of God is on their side. You remember I told you this story about how the uh, Oh, glory to God. The Palestinians were, were shooting rockets over into Israel. It was Hamas, and, and there was this war. They were shooting rockets over from Palestine to Israel. And, oh, but the, 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 
uh, the story said, the news said that their rockets kept turning right before it would get to Israel. Their, their rockets would turn and it would go right down in the water. And when one of the reporters asked of the men the, of Hamas, they said, can you not aim your rockets any better? They said, we do, uh, but their God keeps turning the rockets. <laughs> their God keeps turning the rockets. And, uh, listen, we're aiming right on, but the, for some reason there seems to be a gust, a gust of wind that, that blows her. I tell you what it is, it's God. Amen. But the Bible said it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now where was this famine at? A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. That's where it was at. It was in the land of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, I love to see what names mean in the Bible. So I looked up this name, Bethlehem, Judah. Do you know what that name means? Oh, it's ironic. The name Bethlehem Judah. The name Bethlehem means the house of bread. And the name Judah means the house of praise. So in the place of house of, of bread, in the place of house of praise, now there is a famine in the house of bread. How ironic is that? We're going to see why in just a moment. Amen. Because people say... <laughs> Listen, the, today in this new age, people want to say that, that when you get saved, uh, oh, you're going to have health and you're going to have wealth. That's the new thing. Y'all y'all know the ones I'm talking about, the preachers that get on TV and they say, you send me $1,000, oh, and God's going to keep you alive for a 1,000 years. He's going to give you Lamborghinis. He's going to give you Maserati, sport cars, helicopters, whatever you want so you can be like us. Listen, God ain't trying to feed your flesh. He's trying to feed your spirit, man. Get over your flesh. Listen, that ain't nothing but a lie from the devil. Amen. God ain't worried about how you prosper here. He's worried about prospering over there. He's worried about getting you to heaven, not about making your flesh feel good over here. Now, God will bless you on this side of life. Yes, he will. He'll bless you coming in and bless you going out. But that ain't what God's worried about. You see, we got to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you, He said. Amen. But, but they say when you're saved and you're a Christian that, that life is a bed of roses. Once you get saved, man, there's no problems, there's no trials. Everything is going to be all right. Like that song, Every Little Thing. It's going to be all right. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. Every little thing's going to be all right. That's what they say. And, and the very first bump in the road that these Christians come to, they say, well, that preacher lied to me. That man of God lied to me. That woman of God lied to me. Therefore, that Jesus that they're giving must not be real either. If they're going to lie about that, then Jesus must not be real either. I'm going to tell you something. You better watch what you tell people because they take it to heart. Then this, the Bible said, Jesus Christ said in John 16, 33, that in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trial. You're going to have tribulation. Oh, but he didn't stop there. He said, but... Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. So, church, I just got to be honest with you this morning. If you're getting saved just because you don't want there to be no problems in life, then that's the wrong reason. And you in the wrong religion. Because Jesus said, when you get saved, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trial. You're going to have problems. But he said, but... Be a good seer, for I've overcome the world. And because I overcome the world, now you're an overcomer through me. Amen? Through Jesus. But I want you to understand there's different types of famines that we go through in our spiritual walk with God. There, there's famines. Uh, sometimes there's famines because of sickness and death. There may be somebody in here this morning, you're going through a famine in your life because you, you're sick. And, and there may be somebody in here that has uh, uh, extreme pain in your body and, and pain is your companion and you know you hurt all the time. And, and, and listen, there's sometimes that people hear those words, Brother Bill, uh, cancer and, and malignant and different words and, and they get down and out and they get depressed and, and they get in a spiritual rut 
because of, of something that they've heard from a doctor or because of pain and suffering, because of the death of a loved one. Listen, I know we've all experienced it in here this morning. I can look out and see many faces that have experienced the loss of a loved one. And just because of that, listen, don't let it get you so far down in the spiritual rut that you want to give up on God. Listen, because there is still hope and God's going to bring you through it. Uh, amen. Sometimes we get in a spiritual rut in our marriages. And, you know, they come to church and, and, and act like uh, all our marriage is so great. It's perfect. We have no problems. Uh, and you know good and well when you get to the car, you're going to be arguing again. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Oh, amen. And, and you know what? We pretend because on the outside, we want everybody to be happy. I'm not just talking about us here. Amen. That's why we drive separate vehicles. Amen. We went over that last week. Amen. Now I'm playing. But there is times that you get in a rut, even in your marriage. But God can restore. Listen, don't give up. Don't give up. God will restore everything if you'll just hold on. Just hold on. In this place, they're in the house of bread. They're in Israel. They're in Bethlehem, Judah. This is the place of God. And even in the house of God, you will have people in a spiritual rut. Even when you look around and you see uh, your church is growing, you're on fire for God. There's people growing by leaps and bounds. But here you are stuck in a spiritual rut. Uh, and you're still studying the Word. You're still learning the Word. Uh, you're still hearing the Word. Uh, but you're still in a rut. I know somebody's there. God wouldn't have given me this message this morning if they wouldn't. Somebody here. Listen, I want you to tell you about a man named Elijah. Oh, glory to God. I tell you every Sunday about how Elijah called fire down from heaven. But I don't ever tell you the rest of it. But God took me there this morning to tell you. When Elijah went to Mount Carmel and he called down fire from heaven and it ate up all the, the sacrifice and the 850 prophets of Baal, let me tell you what happened. Then Elijah left and ran for his life right. because Ahab and his wife Jezebel were going to kill him for making a mockery out of them and out of their prophets. And so the Bible said that Elijah, the prophet of God, I'm talking about a mighty prophet of God, he took off running. Yes, he did. And God said, I want you to go down to this brook. And he goes down to this little brook. And you know what he does, Sister Linda? He stays at this brook and he lays down and he don't do nothing but eat and sleep for 40 days. 40 days Elijah laid there eating and sleeping and did not want to live. He even cried out, God, go ahead and take my life. I want to die. I know when I leave here, I'm going to die anyways. He had just done the greatest miracle. God had done it through him. Let me put it that way. But he had just been the vessel that was used by God to call fire down from heaven. And it was amazing. But the very next day, he's running for his life. That's right. I'm going to tell you, we can be in the fire and yet still be in a spiritual rut. You can be in the house of God and yet still be in depression. He sat there 40 days and nights. All he wanted to do was eat and sleep. That shows you he was in a deep state of depression. And there's Christians, don't you feel alone? Don't you feel if you're going through some kind of depression, don't you hold it in? You come and let God have you pour it out on the altar. You come and tell somebody, talk to somebody. Don't you try to do it by yourself. Because that's why you hear people going. There was uh, three preachers last year. Preachers now. One's over churches. Pastors over churches out west. I read about where the pastor left church, went home and committed suicide. And all three of them was eat up with depression. There was a mighty man of God by the name of C.H. Spurgeon. I don't know if you ever heard of Charles Spurgeon. A mighty man of God. But that man of God, he went around. There's been many, a, a thousand of people were saved because under his ministry. And there was many people called to work for Christ because of his ministry. But C.H. Spurgeon was a man who, who was 
uh, affluent with pain. He had gout that come in his legs and in his feet and it spread all over his body. At 30 years old, he was in chronic pain all the time. That it's, he was so much that he, he preached about pain that was in his feet and in his hands. And, and, and not only was he in pain, uh, chronic pain with gout and, and so many other things, but he was a depressed man. He fell into a state of depression so much that it took him two years to get over it. Two years he stepped out from behind the pulpit of God because he said, I can't preach being depressed like I am. I've got to overcome it before I step back out and preach the gospel. And so Charles Spurgeon, that may be something you didn't know about him. He, he, he wound up in depression, a mighty man of God. He was hurting. He was in a rut. He was in a spiritual famine. Church, listen, I'm going to go get to the good point in a minute, but right now I need you to understand that you can find yourself even in the house of bread, the house of praise. You can find yourself in a famine if you're not careful. And it's not all the time. It's not our fault. It's not because of sin. Sometimes we find ourselves there because God is preparing us for something greater. Let me go right here to the next point. It said, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, that name meaning house of bread, house of praise. He went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now this right here, let me read the next verse. And the name of the man was Elimelech. Now I'm going to stop right there. The name of the man was Elimelech. But it said that Elimelech, this was Naomi's husband. Said that Elimelech, the man of the house, that he took his two sons and he took his wife Naomi. And he said instead of staying there, he was in a famine. If he was in a rut, he, he was there and he was hungry. And instead of trying to do something good to come out of that famine that they were in, it said that Elimelech threw up his hands and said, I've had it. I quit. There's no use. I, I, I'm going somewhere else. And so he rooted up his family from the house of bread and the house of praise. And he took them to a land called Moab. Moab comes from the, the sons and daughters of Lot. It was a, a place that any time you study in the Old Testament, Moab meant it was a worldly, idolatrous place. And so in other words, this man named Elimelech is now, he's rooted up his family, and he's took them out of the house of bread, out of the house of praise, and he's took them to a worldly, <coughs> idolatrous place called Moab. <coughs> And I'm going to tell you something, all because he give up in the famine. And I want to ask you this morning, or not ask you, but I want to mention this to you this morning. If you find yourself going through this famine, even in the house of God, we, we've already showed you how that works. If you find yourself going through, don't give up, don't lose hope, don't quit, because not only do your life hang in the balance, but your family's life hangs in the balance. Because you never know who you're going to take with you. Usually when one person gives up, Brother David, it ain't just that one person that it affects. It's a ripple effect. And I'm telling you before you know it, you've got five or six people done fell out of church because one person quit. One person give up and said, I can't take it. I'm done. I give up. I, I, I'm done in this thing. And I'm going somewhere else because they looked like there was something better in Moab than what was in Israel. And so we find out right here that he took his family. He took his wife, Naomi. Listen to verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Malon and Chilion. What's some names, right? What's some names? That's nearly as bad last week as Nadab and Abihu. <laughs> These people, my goodness. Mala and Chilion, they were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab, and they continued there, or they remained there. So Elimelech brought his wife Naomi and their two children, Chilion and what's the other one's name? Malon. They took them, and they all come to the land of Moab where they stayed. Verse number three. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, he died, and she was left. And her two sons. 
Have y'all ever seen this before in your Christian walk? Where somebody is so on fire for God, somebody's in church all the time, somebody loves the Lord, and all of a sudden they drop it and they go chasing the world and they end up dying as soon as they step out. And you're thinking, my goodness, I hope, I pray that these folks cried out to God before it was too late. I pray these folks got right with God. Listen, they loved God. They was on fire for God. But yet, Moab looked better to them than what the house of bread had. And so they left. And God called them home. God called them out of this world. Listen, I'm going to tell you, there's a dangerous place to be in. When you step out of under God's protection, you step out from under God's hand, and you go out in the world seeking something else, it's a dangerous place to be. Let me go on down here and get to the point. The Bible said, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, or Orpa, not Oprah. Amen. <laughs> it was Orpa, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. So now we see that not only did they come to the land of Moab, but Elimelech's two sons, the, the Jewish boys, now they have married women outside of the tribe of Israel. And this was not a racial thing. This was a thing that God had set up because in Deuteronomy it said if you marry somebody out of your tribe, if they're going to draw you away from the one true God to worshiping idols. And so it was set up from the beginning that everybody in the tribe of Israel should marry an Israelite. They should marry in their own tribe. That They should stay with their own people that, that knew who the true God was. And it was set up by God as a, as a safeguard not to fall. But we see that these men, they married these two women named Orpah and Ruth. There's two more names. <laughs> Amen. My grandma was named Ruth, so I can, I can, I can go along with that name. But Orpah. I don't know about Orpah. And it said the name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other was Ruth and they dwelled there about 10 years and Mahalon and Chilion, they died also, both of them and the women was left of her two sons and her husband. So now I want you to see what this picture is. This, this book of Ruth, it's a beautiful book. It tells about an amazing love story that we're not going to get to all of it today, but Amen. Later we will. But the Bible said that now Elimelech, the man of the house, had died. His two sons had married outside of Israel. They married two Moabite women, two idolatrous women. And the Bible said that now the two sons died, Chilion and Malon. They died. And so now what do we find? We find that there's three women alone in the world. They have no men. They have no male relatives nowhere around them. They're in a foreign land, or Naomi is. Naomi's here, and her husband died. Now her two sons are dead. And you listen, that was a bad place to be in in this time in history. Women could not defend for themselves. They couldn't supply for themselves. That's why even Jesus on the cross, Jesus knew that Joseph had already died. So Jesus looked at John on the cross, and he said, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. In other words, John, Jesus was asking John, John, I'm fixing to leave here. I want you to take care of my mother Mary while I'm gone. Listen, that, that's something. Even today, it's hard sometimes. And I know we got the new feminist movements and all this. Where a woman's supposed to be this and that. Now listen, God didn't set it up to be exactly like that. God set it up for the man to be leader of the household. God set it up for the husband to supply for his wife. Not, I'm not saying the woman can't have a job, we can't do this, can't do that. But what I'm saying is, is the male is supposed to be the leader of the house. And so right here we find there's two women, three women now, that they're all alone. And they can't fend for themselves. But look at what verse number six says. And then she arose with her daughter, our daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab 
She had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. So Naomi right here said, you know what? I think I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. I think I'm going to go back to the house of bread. My husband's dead. My sons are dead. I'm going to go back to where I know uh, God is meeting his people at. I think I'm going to go back to church, she said. And it said right here, she had heard how the Lord had visited people and given them bread. And verse number seven, therefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. So she sets out, y'all, she's going back to Bethlehem, Judah, and her two daughter-in-laws are going to go with her. Orpah and Ruth are going to go with her. And we find out, verse number eight, and Naomi said unto her two daughters, our daughter-in-laws, go and return to your mother's house and the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grants you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Let me read a couple more down here. Listen to what it says. They're wanting to come with her. They said, we're going to go with you, uh, Naomi. We're going back with you. And, and the Lord grant that you find rest. Verse number nine, each of you in the house of her husband. And she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said, surely we will return unto thee with our people. Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? I don't have any more children for you to marry. Turn again, verse 12, my daughters, go your way for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you wait 18 years or 15 years, however long it was in this day and time? Would you wait that long for them? Would you stay for them? No, my daughters, for it great with me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. They lifted up their voice and they wept again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now listen to this verse. This is what I'm going to hit at. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods return thou after thy sister-in-law. So we got to understand here, Naomi She's the mother-in-law. These two girls, her sons died, and so she's going back to her homeland. Her two daughter-in-laws are wanting to go with her. And so they set out on the journey, and Orpah and Ruth said, we're going to go with you. And all of a sudden, Naomi stops as they're traveling, and she said, no, I want y'all to turn around. And go back to the house of your mothers. Go back. You, you don't need to follow me. Why do you want to follow me, she said. Listen, and as I think about this, I think about decisions that we all make in life. How many knows we have decisions to make? Every one of us in this room, we have decisions to make. This was a decision on the part of Naomi. She didn't want those two daughter-in-laws to come back home with her because if them two daughter-in-laws come back home with her, Brother Bill, then it would show that her family was not the way God had intended it to be. It would show her failure and her husband's failure and not training up their child in the way they should go. They went and got married outside the tribe of Israel. They brought them in. And so Naomi is trying to cover it up. Now I know this is going to hit home sometime, somewhere. But I've got to promise you something in here this morning. That there's not a one person in this room that's a parent that can say, I was perfect in raising my kids. We all fall short in that place. And listen, we're all learning. Every day we're learning. And if your kids are done grown, I'm sure you're still learning. But, oh yeah, that's right. But Naomi said, I don't want them to go with me. So y'all just stay where you are. She's trying to cover it up. Let me read to you what the Bible says about covering up your sins. Proverbs 28. And I'm going to go right back to that so you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but you can if you do. Proverbs 28. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Proverbs 28 and verse number 13. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not 
prosper. But whoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You see, Naomi, Brother Rick, she's trying to cover up her sins. She's trying to cover up her shortcomings, her failures. She don't want the children of Israel to know when she gets there that her children was wayward and that they went out and married other women. And, and so she said, y'all stay here. She's trying to cover it up. You say, you know what the underlying problem with, with that is? It's pride. It's pride. She didn't want the people to know that she had failed. She didn't want the people to know that she had fallen short. And so she said, I'm just going to hide it. I'm going to cover it up. But I want to tell you something, church. Don't cover up your sin. God's not calling you to cover it up. God's calling you to be real. God's calling you to be authentic. God's calling you to be transparent. And I'm not saying we have to parade about in our shortcomings. We're not, well, I'm not going to go there. We're not, uh, glory to God, we're not a Catholic church. You don't have to come and tell all your sins to us. Can I say that? Amen. We're not a Catholic church. You don't come and pray to us. You pray pray to God. You come and fall on your knees at the altar and say, God in heaven, I have sinned. I've fallen short. Glory to God. And he's the one that will be just and faithful to forgive you. But God don't call you to be fake. He calls you to be real. He calls you to be transparent and open. Listen, just talk to God. He already knows. Instead of trying to cover up your sins, God, I got everything under control. My life's going just fine. Just say, Lord, I, I'm falling. I'm messing up. He already knows. He already knows everything that's going on in your life. So don't try to cover up. Just be real with God. And so this woman, she was covering up her sins. And, and she said, God, go stay. But then I want you to look at the next one, an Orpah. Orpah. Naomi covered up. And Orpah gave up. Orpah made the decision you know, she, she first said, Naomi, I'm going with you. And she hugged her and she kissed her and she took off following after him. Verse number 6 and verse number 10. You can read that right there. Where she took off hard. She was going and following Naomi wherever she went. She said, I'm going to go with you. And she hugged her. She was emotional. She kissed her. She was determined. But the Bible said in verse number 15, I want you to look at this. In verse number 15, and she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So Naomi said, Look, as soon as Orpah come up and kissed her, she took off and went right back into her idols, right back into her bondage, right back into her slavery, right back in. And Orpah, give up! Now I got to make this point and then I'm going to make one more and I'm doing. Orpah was a person who was indecisive. There is a such way in the church, in the house of God, in the kingdom of God, there is a such way that you can come so close to faith in God but not ever cross that bridge to true faith in God. Listen, she was dissolved. She was uh, determined. She was going to follow her. She was emotional. I'm going to follow you back. Uh, I, I, she was kissed her. She had her mind made up. She was going to follow her. But as soon as she started thinking about it, she jetted and give up. Naomi covered up. Orpah give up. She was indecisive. And I'm going to tell you something. Orpah is never heard of again. When she turned and she went back, never again do you ever hear the name Orpah anywhere in the Bible. Never again in history have you ever heard of Orpah. I'm talking about she went and she, because she listened to Naomi, Naomi said, go back. And I was mad, Brother Bill, when I read this. I'm thinking, what in the world would a believer do? Or, or where would a believer be saying, go back to your old gods? Why would we tell somebody, go back and live in sin and you'll be all right? That's what Naomi did and Orpah listened to her. You see, Naomi was just worried about her temporary distress and she wasn't thinking nothing about Orpah and Ruth's eternal doom. You see, because there's something out there, church. There's something down the line that we need to be worrying about. Not about the temporary here and now, but our eternal by and by. 
And every decision that we make today, there is a consequence to it tomorrow. Every action, there is a consequence to every decision. It, it is once said that decisions are what makes history. You can't do something unless you make the decision to do it. Decisions make history. And they only made the decision, I'm going back alone. Y'all two got to stay. And Orpah listened to Naomi. She left. And she was never heard of again. Probably lost. And on her way to a devil's hell. Because she listened to what Naomi said. Now listen, there's one more person I want to talk to you about. Orpah, she gave up. And she was never heard of again. But there's one who didn't give up. Her name was Ruth. You know what Ruth did? Naomi covered up. Orpah gave up. But Ruth stepped up. Amen. And she was written right into the Bible, the Holy Scriptures of God. I'm going to show you why. Right here, the Bible said that. Verse 15. Naomi, the mother-in-law, she said, Behold your sister. She's gone back to her people and unto her God's return after your sister-in-law. Go after her. Do you need to go back with her, Ruth? But listen to what Ruth said, verse 16 through 18. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. Don't even ask me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And when you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also... If all but death part thee and me. And when we, she saw that she was made up her mind, she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she quit speaking to her. I want you to see something right here. Orpah give up. Naomi covered up, but Ruth stepped up. Hallelujah. Naomi said, you need to go after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, don't even ask me to go because I ain't going. Oh, I got a love for you, Naomi. I got a love for your God. And I, you can ask all you want to, but you ain't changing my mind because where you go, I'm going. Where you're staying, I'm staying. I'm going to be with you. In other words, she was one of them clingy type people. They won't let go. I know y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> she said, I'm not going nowhere. I'm going to trust in God, and I'm going to follow him. I'm going to trust in God, and I'm following you, Naomi. I'm going back with you. And I'm going to tell you something. If Ruth had not stepped up and obeyed and trusted God, let me tell you what happens in the rest of this story. Ruth goes back with Naomi. And I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll probably talk about this later on. Ruth goes back to her with her mother-in-law. And there she finds her knight in shining armor. And there she finds Boaz. And her and Boaz get married, Brother Bruce. And, and Boaz, do y'all remember a few Sundays ago we was talking about uh, Rahab the harlot? Boaz is Rahab's son. Boaz is Rahab's son. Okay, that's another story. But anyways, Boaz and Ruth fall in love. They get married. They have a son named Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has 12 sons and the youngest boy is named David. That is the little shepherd boy that went out and defeated a giant called Goliath. That is the same shepherd boy that Samuel went and anointed as king over Israel. That is the same, oh hallelujah, David that ruled and reigned the kingdom of Israel. It is the same David that Jesus Christ come through the seed line. That's why he was called the son of David. So if Ruth had not have listened, if Ruth would have listened to Naomi, then we would have never heard who Ruth was. We would have never heard who Obed was and Jesse was and David was and Jesus couldn't have come through the seed line of David and God the Father would have had to look to another family. Listen, our decisions, our choices that we make, our decisions are that important, church. They're that important. We don't know if it just has us in the balance or like Ruth, they had everything in the balance. You can turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 1 and you'll see the genealogy starts with a non-Israelite woman named Ruth. Amen. She married Boaz. 
And they had Obed. Obed had Jesse. Jesse had David. Glory to God. And out come the Savior of the world through that seed line. I'm telling you, this is a story. It's beautiful. Oh, it's compassionate. It's in the time of evil darkness where love and light prevails. And I got to tell you this morning, church, love and light will always prevail over evil and darkness. No matter how much the enemy tries to push you down, no matter how much the enemy tries to cover your eyes, light and goodness and Oh, glory to God. Our Lord will always prevail. Amen. Oh, it's beautiful. I love this story. And she said, don't even try to ask me. Because I'm going with you. And verse number 18, look what it said. And when she saw that she had made up her mind, that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. You see, she had her mind made up. Ruth, mind was made up. Just like Joshua says, choose this day, make up your mind. Ruth said, I've got my mind made up. I'm serving the Lord. I'm following you back to Bethlehem. I'm going with you. And if you'll notice with me, you can jot this down if you're taking notes. In verse number 8, verse number 8, and then in verse number 11, and in verse number 12, and in verse number 15, there's something here that keeps saying the same words over and over and over again. And it's the words, turn back. Turn back. Go back. Turn back. And I'm going to tell you what. They were pressuring Ruth and Orpah to turn back to their old lifestyle. To go back. And we in the house of God today, we have the same pressure upon us. The devil's hollering. The world's hollering. Even some Christians are hollering. Amen. Go back to your old way. You had it better off then. Remember Moses in Egypt and the children of Israel? They said, we had it better off in Egypt. God had just set them free from being slaves for 400 years. And they said, we had it better off. We want to go back. Listen, God didn't set you free to go back to that mess. God set you free to live for him. And to be like Ruth, make up your mind. And God said, if you will step up and you will trust, I will do great things to you. He took this one nun Israelite woman named Ruth, and he brought the Savior of the world. See, Ruth was David's great-grandma, and she was Jesus' great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandma. I don't know how far it was. It was a long ways. But what I'm saying is this. If you'll trust God, don't cover up. Oh, don't give up, but step up and trust God. And he's going to do something great through you, I promise. Would you stand all over this house? Hallelujah. But we may hit on this later on. I don't know whatever the Lord leads us to do. But I want to ask you this this morning. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says in Isaiah 55. Let me pull this up and read it to you real quick while you're standing. Isaiah 55. It says, Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I love that scripture right there. Amen. It said, Return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon you. There's a lot of people that's in that same place as Orpah and, and Ruth. They, they're, they're on the road and they don't know which road to take. And they're wanting to go back to Bethlehem. But they're hearing all this, this peer pressure. They're hearing all these words and, and voices come in and say, Go back to your old self. Go back to your old ways. And just like Orpah, 90% of the people today give up, Brother Bill. There's a lot of Christians that's hearing that voice right now. Even in this sanctuary, you're hearing that voice. The devil trying to whisper in your ear saying, go back to your old ways. But the Bible said, don't go back. The world hollers that. The enemy hollers that. Even some Christians holler that. But God said, don't turn back. No matter how bad the trouble is, no matter how bad depression is, no matter how strong the storm blows, no matter what, do not turn back. Don't Lose hope and don't give up. You stay trusting the Lord and he's going to do something great and mighty through your life. He said if you'll return to the Lord, he will show you mercy. He will give you grace in the time of need and he will abundantly pardon 
that abundantly part, you know what that means? It means all the evil and sin that we've done, everything where we've messed up. God said, I don't care. I just want you to return back to me. I will abundantly pardon just like a, a, a warden of a prison. They're able to take a prisoner and say, you're done. You're pardoned. Just like the president's able to say, you pardoned. I'm telling you, we got a God. Amen, the King of kings and Lord of lords that said, I know what you've done, son. I know what you've done, daughter, but you are pardoned because my grace, my blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, it will abundantly pardon. So the devil wants you to think, Brother Steve, that when you mess up, that's it, you fall. Him. And God don't care. God's mad at you. God don't love you no more. But the, the truth of the matter is, is God is desperately in love with you. He's madly in love with you. And he's not saying go the other way. He's saying come home, son. Come home, daughter. And he says seek the Lord while he may be found. And that's the other thing in this story. God is not always with the sinner. God don't always work, Sister Linda, with the sinners. God don't always tug on their hearts, Brother Bill. Sometimes we, we feel God tugging on us. We feel God wooing us, drawing us. But the Bible says search him while he may be found. That's the inclination that he's not always going to be there. And people say, well, I, I'm at this point where I'm so close, but, but I don't want to give in yet. I, I, I'm so close, but I'm going to come to God on my own time and on my own terms. But the truth of Scripture says we cannot come to God on our own time. We cannot come to God in our own plans. The only way we can come to God is if the Spirit of the Lord draws us to him. And so we found this in Scripture, seeking while he may be found. And so what I'm saying is, is if the Lord is working on your heart, church, you better run to him right now. If the Lord is working on you and wooing you, you better not let this time, this day, pass you by. That's why the Bible said today is the day of salvation. Because if you let this day pass, God may not be found the next time. Right. And if you don't come to him while he's calling you, our eyes, spiritual eyes, become glazed over. And we'll find ourselves out in the world where we don't even want to be saved anymore. We become cold. We become hard. And that's what the Bible says. He calls a reprobate mind. And you have to try to come to the Lord on your own. If you can't do it, we can't come to God unless he draws us. Amen. I know I'm rambling on this morning, but I feel the Lord drawing somebody here. Amen. And I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, you got a friend in Jesus. He's waiting on you. Amen. He's waiting on you. You got a friend in the Lord. Amen. You got something you can play? Well, go ahead, turn it on. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our piano player had to go. We're going to have a prayer for them in a minute. But if there's somebody in this house right now, you feel the Lord tugging on your heart. You feel the Lord drawing you. Don't let this day go by. Do not let the day go by without coming and talking to God. Hallelujah, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we declared your word the way you give it to us. And Lord, now it's on you. We're asking you, Lord, to draw us. Draw the hearts, Lord God. Draw us to you. And Lord, don't let nobody leave here lost and undone. Don't let nobody leave here sick and hurt today, God. I pray, God, that you would put your hand upon them, lift up their head, and draw them to the cross. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise he never shuts your head down. Thank you, Jesus. He always comes and picks it up. These altars are open. He wipes off the stars, Amen. the battle scars on These the altars face. are open. If you need prayer, you come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reach out to him right now.